Welcome to Jeremy's IT Lab. This is a free, complete course for the CCNA. If you like these videos, please subscribe to follow along with the series. Also, please like and leave a comment, and share the video to help spread this free series of videos. Thanks for your help. In this video, we will continue our study of spanning tree, focusing instead on an updated version called rapid spanning tree. More specifically, we'll be looking at Cisco's version, Rapid per VLAN spanning tree. You saw in the previous lecture that classic spanning tree can be quite slow, taking up to 50 seconds for the network to converge after a change in the topology. As the name implies, rapid spanning tree improves this time, only taking a few seconds to respond to changes in the network. Because rapid spanning tree is superior to classic spanning tree, it is the default on most devices now and the CCNA exam topics only mention rapid spanning tree. However, I think it is important to understand classic spanning tree, and now that you know about classic spanning tree, rapid spanning tree will be much easier to learn. Let's take a look at what we'll cover in this video. First up, let's take a few minutes to compare different versions of STP. In the past few videos, I've mentioned multiple versions, STP, PVST+, Rapid STP, Rapid PVST+, Multiple Spanning Tree. Just so there is no confusion, I will summarize each version and clarify between the industry standards and the Cisco proprietary versions. Then the rest of the video will be all about Rapid Spanning Tree, specifically the version which operates on Cisco switches, Rapid per VLAN Spanning Tree Plus. Also, make sure to watch until the end of today's quiz, I will once again feature a bonus question from Boson Software's XSIM for the CCNA, a set of practice exams for the CCNA, which I highly recommend. Ask anywhere on the internet for CCNA practice exam recommendations, and people are going to recommend Boson. If you want to get a copy of XSIM to prepare for the exam, follow the link in the video description. Let's start by summarizing the different versions of Spanning Tree. On the left, I will list the industry standard versions, the IEEE standards. On the right, I will list the Cisco proprietary versions, Cisco's upgrades to some of the standard versions. First up, the classic spanning tree protocol, IEEE standard 802.1D. This is the original spanning tree protocol. According to Wikipedia, it was originally published in 1990 although the original spanning tree was actually created in 1985, before being standardized. In classic STP, all VLANs share one STP instance. Therefore, we cannot load balance using classic STP, because there is only one instance. We cannot block different ports in each VLAN to achieve load balancing. So, Cisco decided to improve upon this. They developed per VLAN spanning tree plus. Actually, before that, they developed regular per VLAN spanning tree, which, as I mentioned before, only supported ISL trunk encapsulation, no .1Q. But let's forget about that version, since everyone uses .1Q for their trunk encapsulation these days. It's Cisco's upgrade to 802.1D. Each VLAN has its own STP instance. In the previous lab, when we configured STP, we had to include the VLAN number in each command. For example, spanning tree VLAN 1 root primary. That's because a separate STP instance is running for each VLAN. Why is this good? Well, as you already know, we can load balance by blocking different ports in each VLAN, in each STP instance. We can use our network bandwidth more effectively, since we don't have any connections going totally unused, just waiting for another connection to fail. Now, as you also know, Classic Spanning Tree and PVST Plus are quite slow. The max age timer is 20 seconds, and the listening and learning states are 15 seconds each, so it can take up to 50 seconds to respond to changes in the network. That's simply not fast enough for modern networks. This was solved in Rapid Spanning Tree Protocol, IEEE Standard 802.1W. It is much faster at converging and adapting to network changes than 802.1D. However, just like 802.1D, the industry standard rapid spanning tree protocol runs only one STP instance, shared by all VLANs. Therefore, it also cannot load balance. 
Cisco once again developed an improved version of the industry standard, Rapid Per VLAN Spanning Tree Plus, or Rapid PVST Plus. It is Cisco's upgrade to 802.1W, featuring the improved speed of Rapid STP, plus it runs a separate STP instance for each VLAN. Therefore, it can load balance by blocking different ports in each VLAN, just like the previous PVST Plus. The final version is Multiple Spanning Tree Protocol, IEEE Standard 802.1S. It uses modified RSTP mechanics, but the main improvement is that it can group multiple VLANs into different instances. For example, if there are 10 VLANs, VLANs 1 to 5 in instance 1, and VLANs 6 to 10 in instance 2 to perform load balancing. Finally, an industry standard version of STP that allows load balancing, and actually it's superior to Cisco's Rapid PVST. If you have many VLANs, let's say 200 in your network, configuring primary and secondary root bridges in each VLAN is a lot of work. However, with MSTP, all you have to do is assign VLANs 1 to 100 to instance 1, and VLANs 101 to 200 to instance 2, and then configure the primary and secondary root bridges for instance 1 and instance 2. So it's much easier to configure and manage. Actually, Cisco hasn't developed their own version of MSTP. Cisco devices simply run the industry standard 802.1S. For large networks, it's best to use MSTP. However, for small to medium networks without a huge number of VLANs, Cisco's Rapid PVST Plus is what you'll probably run on your switches, and that's the version we'll be focusing on today. It's also the version that is mentioned in the official exam topics list. Also, all of the information here applies to the standard 802.1W, but that's not the version that runs on Cisco switches. The good news is, since you already understand Classic STP and PVST Plus, it will be much easier to learn Rapid STP and Rapid PVST Plus by comparing it to the previous versions. Let's get started. Before getting into the details, here is Cisco's summary of RSTP. RSTP is not a timer-based spanning tree algorithm like 802.1D. Therefore, RSTP offers an improvement over the 30 seconds or more that 802.1D takes to move a link to forwarding. The heart of the protocol is a new bridge-to-bridge -bridge handshake mechanism, which allows ports to move directly to forwarding. So, that's the big difference between RSTP and 802.1D STP. 802.1D uses long timers to determine when it's safe to move to the next state, and these timers are quite long to ensure that no loops are accidentally created when a port starts forwarding. Back when the original STP was created, it was acceptable that a port could take 30 to 50 seconds to react to a change and start forwarding traffic. However, that's no longer the case. So, RSTP uses a handshake mechanism, which allows switches to actively negotiate with other switches and move ports immediately to the forwarding state if appropriate. Okay, now I will introduce some of the specifics of RSTP. By the way, I will probably say RSTP sometimes and Rapid PVST Plus other times. Really, I'm talking about the same thing. Cisco's Rapid PVST Plus operates the same as RSTP, but with the addition of a separate instance for each VLAN. So I will use the two terms interchangeably. Let's summarize some similarities between STP and RSTP. First of all, RSTP serves the same purpose as STP, blocking specific ports to prevent layer two loops. RSTP elects a root bridge with the same rules as STP. I'm sure you know it by now, the switch with the lowest bridge ID becomes the root bridge. RSTP also elects root ports with the same rules as STP. So the interface with the lowest root cost becomes the root port, with the same tiebreakers, neighbor bridge ID and then neighbor port ID. You studied this in Day 20's video, our first video on STP. Finally, RSTP elects designated ports with the same rules as STP. So the interface on the switch with the lowest root cost will become designated, and the interface on the other switch will be non-designated. If there is a tie, the switch with the lowest bridge ID will set its interface to designated. 
Cisco has said that RSTP isn't a revolution of STP, just an evolution. It made some major improvements to speed up STP, but it didn't change it completely, as you can see here. Now let's look at some of the differences of STP and RSTP. First up, port costs were updated for rapid spanning tree. Classic spanning tree defines port speeds up to 10 gigabits per second, and I believe port speeds faster than this are all given a cost of one. To accommodate for faster speeds, RSTP's cost values were expanded. 2 million for 10 megabits per second, 200,000 for 100 megabits per second, 20,000 for 1 gigabit per second, 2,000 for 10 gigabits per second, 200 for 100 gigabits per second, and 20 for 1 terabit per second. Beyond this, a 10 terabit per second interface would have a cost of 2. Use the flashcards to remember the port costs of both classic and rapid STP. Here's a slide from day 21, the different port states of classic spanning tree protocol. Hopefully you remember these states, which ones send and receive BP to use, which one forwards traffic, and which ones learn MAC addresses, etc. However, rapid spanning tree simplifies the port states, reducing them to just three by combining three of these states into one. The three states that are combined into one are blocking, listening, and disabled. Actually, a more accurate way is to say that the blocking and disabled port states were combined into one, and the listening state is simply not used. So the listening state is gone, and the blocking and disabled states have become the discarding state. If a port is administratively disabled, meaning it has the shutdown command applied to it, it will be in a discarding state in RSTP. This was previously the disabled state. If a port is enabled, but blocking traffic to prevent layer 2 loops, it is also in a discarding state. This was previously the blocking state. Next, how about port roles? Remember, the three original port roles are root, designated, and non-designated. The root port role remains unchanged in RSTP. The port that is closest to the root bridge becomes the root port for the switch. Of course, closest means the port with the lowest root cost. Also, the root bridge is the only switch that doesn't have a root port. So these points are the same as what you already learned about classic spanning tree. The designated port role also remains unchanged in RSTP. The port on a segment, which is another name for a collision domain, that sends the best BPDU is that segment's designated port, and there can only be one designated port per segment. The other port on the segment is either a root port or a non-designated port in classic spanning tree. However, the non-designated port role was divided into two separate roles in RSTP. Those are the alternate port role and the backup port role. Let's break down those two roles. First up, the alternate port role. The RSTP alternate port role is a discarding port that receives a superior BPDU from another switch. This is the same as what you've already learned about blocking ports in classic STP. In our little topology down here, switch 1 is the root bridge. When BPDUs are sent in this topology, switch 3 receives a superior BPDU from switch 2. It's superior because the bridge ID of switch 2 is lower than switch 3. So switch 2's interface is designated, and switch 3's is an alternate port. An alternate port basically functions as a backup to the root port. If the root port fails, the switch can immediately move its best alternate port to forwarding, as the new root port. If switch 3's root port fails, its alternate port is ready to immediately become the root port, with no transitional states. This immediate move to forwarding state functions like a classic STP optional feature called uplink fast. Because it is built into RSTP, you do not need to activate uplink fast when using RSTP or rapid PVST+. We didn't look at uplink fast in the previous videos. It's not mentioned in the exam topics list, but try to remember that its functions are built into rapid spanning tree. You might get asked about that on the exam. So, Uplink Fast is one STP optional feature that was incorporated into RSTP. Since I just mentioned one, I'd like to briefly explain one more that was incorporated into RSTP. Neither of these are on the exam topics list, so you don't have to learn them in depth, 
but just be aware of their general functionality because they are part of RSTP. One more STP optional feature that was built into RSTP is Backbone Fast. Let's say Switch 2's root port is cut off, so it stops receiving BPDUs from the root bridge. It will then assume it is the root bridge, so it will send its own BPDUs to Switch 3. However, Switch 3 is now receiving BPDUs from both Switch 1 and Switch 2, but Switch 2's BPDUs are inferior. They have a higher bridge ID. Without this backbone fast functionality, Switch 3 would just ignore these BPDUs from Switch 2 until its non-designated port, in classic STP, finally changes to a forwarding state and forwards the superior BPDUs to Switch 2, which then accepts Switch 1 as its root bridge again. However, Backbone Fast allows Switch 3 to expire the max age timer on that interface and rapidly forward the superior BPDUs to Switch 2. This functionality is built into RSTP, so it does not need to be configured. So that's a very basic explanation of Backbone Fast. Let's look at a quick summary on the next slide. Uplink Fast and Backbone Fast are two optional features in classic STP. They must be configured to operate on the switch, but it's not necessary to know how to do so for the CCNA. Both features are built into RSTP, so if the switch is running RSTP, you do not have to configure them. They operate by default on all switches running RSTP. Finally, you do not need to have a detailed understanding of them for the CCNA. I recommend that you know their names and their basic purpose, which is to help blocking or discarding ports move to forwarding without delay. If you want to learn more, do a Google search for Spanning Tree Uplink Fast or Spanning Tree Backbone Fast. Learning how to effectively search on Google for information is an essential part of being a good network engineer, to be honest. We Google things all the time in our daily work, and you can bet I Google things a lot when preparing these videos. So, if you ever want to learn more about a topic in one of these videos, take the chance to improve your Google skills and try to search for some good resources. Okay, after that little detour, let's look at the last port role in RSTP. We just saw the alternate port role, which is just like the non-designated port role we saw in the previous lectures. Next up, let's look at the backup port role. The RSTP backup port role is a discarding port that receives a superior BPDU from another interface on the same switch. This only happens when two interfaces are connected to the same collision domain via a hub. Notice that there is now an Ethernet hub connected between switch 2 and switch 3. When BPDUs are sent in this network, the BPDU sent out of switch 2's designated port is flooded by the hub. And as you can see here, it receives that same BPDU on a different interface. That's why this interface is a backup port, not an alternate port. However, I've already told you that hubs are not used in modern networks, so you will probably not encounter an RSTP backup port. It's still something you should know. RSTP backup ports function as a backup for a designated port. If Switch 2's designated port fails, its backup port immediately begins forwarding traffic as a designated port. Now, as for how the switch chooses which port will be the designated port and which will be the backup port, the interface with the lowest port ID will be selected as the designated port, and the other will be the backup port. Before moving on, let's try out a quiz question. Identify the root bridge and the RSTP port role of each switch interface in this network. By the way, the hub doesn't participate in spanning tree. Hubs aren't sophisticated enough to use spanning tree, so it just floods all frames it receives. Okay, pause the video here to find the answer. Okay, let's check the answer. The root bridge is switch one, because all switches have the same priority and switch one has the lowest MAC address. It is elected as the root. Its interfaces are designated ports. These are the root ports for each switch. Switch 2 and Switch 3's root ports are obvious. They have the lowest root cost. How about Switch 4's root port? The hub doesn't participate in STP, so it doesn't add any cost to the BPDU, 
So why did switch 4 choose G01 over G00? It's because the neighbor bridge ID is lower via G01, because switch 2 has a lower MAC address than switch 3. Switch 2's G01 connected to switch 4's G01 becomes designated. Now how about the connection between switch 3 and switch 4? First of all, which switch sets its interface to designated? Well, switch 3 has a lower root cost, so one of its interfaces will be the designated port. Which one? G00 has the lower port ID, so it will be the designated port in this collision domain. How about switch 3's G01 and switch 4's G00? Switch 3's G01 receives the superior BPDU, with the lower port ID from the same switch, so it's a backup port. Switch 4's G00 receives the superior BPDU from a different switch, so it is an alternate port. Okay, those are the answers. Hopefully you answered correctly. If not, don't worry. There will be more practice at the end of the video. Now let's take a quick look at the CLI. I'm on switch 3 here. As I showed you in the last video, there are three STP modes you can run on a Cisco switch. MST, PVST, and Rapid PVST. Rapid PVST is the default on modern Cisco switches. So you probably won't have to use this command, but I entered spanning tree mode Rapid PVST to make sure it runs in Rapid PVST mode. Then I used show spanning tree to confirm. Notice that it says spanning tree enabled protocol RSTP. Previously, when we were using classic STP, it said IEEE. Now it says RSTP. Although it says RSTP, this is in fact Cisco's Rapid PVST Plus running. Now, the only other difference I want to point out is this. As shown in the network diagram, Switch 3's G01 interface has the backup role. The status is still listed as BLK for blocking, although this state is actually called discarding in Rapid STP. I use the show spanning tree command on switch 4 also. As in the network diagram, switch 4's G00 interface is an alternate port. Once again, this command lists the status as blocking, but remember the rapid STP name for this state is actually discarding. Just one note about running different STP versions. Rapid STP is compatible with classic STP. The interface, or interfaces, on the Rapid STP enabled switch connected to the Classic STP enabled switch will operate in Classic STP mode with the same timers, the same blocking to listening to learning to forwarding state process, etc. So if you have a really old switch that doesn't run Rapid STP, you can still use it in a network of Rapid STP enabled switches. They will adjust the operation of those specific interfaces to match the slower switch. So in our network diagram, if switch 4 was running classic STP, switch 2 and switch 3 would make these interfaces run in classic STP mode, but their interfaces connected to switch 1 would remain in rapid STP mode. Next, let's look at the updated BPDU for RSTP. Here on the left is the classic STP BPDU for comparison. I made it smaller so you can see the rapid STP BPDU better. Most of the BPDU remains unchanged, but there are some differences you should know. As I mentioned last time, you don't need to memorize the BPDU. That's more depth than is required for the CCNA. You just need to know a few aspects of it and what kinds of things are included in it. The first difference to know between these two BPDUs is here. Notice that the RSTP BPDU has a protocol version of two, whereas classic spanning tree has a version of zero. Remember these version numbers for the exam. 0 for classic STP, 2 for rapid STP. The rapid STP BPDU also has a BPDU type of 2. Now the next difference is here. The classic STP BPDU uses only two bits of the BPDU flags, the first bit and the eighth bit. However, the rapid STP BPDU uses all eight bits. These flags are used in the negotiation process that allows rapid STP to converge much faster than classic STP. 
That's all you really need to know about the Rapid STP BPDU itself, compared to the previous version. But there is one more major difference. In classic STP, only the root bridge originated BPDUs. The other switches just forwarded the BPDUs they received. In Rapid STP, all switches originate and send their own BPDUs from their designated ports. Let's go through a few other differences. First, as I just said, all switches running Rapid STP send their own BPDUs. Switches also age the BPDU information much more quickly. In classic STP, a switch waits 10 hello intervals, which is 20 seconds. In rapid STP, a switch considers a neighbor lost if it misses three BPDUs, which is six seconds. It will then flush, meaning delete, all MAC addresses learned on that interface. Why does it do this? Because the neighbor is down, it knows it can't reach anything through that interface anymore. For example, in this network, traffic from PC1 to PC2 usually follows this path. But what if this connection is cut off? This switch will think, I can't reach this neighbor anymore. I'll clear all entries for this interface from my MAC table, and its other interface will become the root port. Then, if PC1 wants to send traffic to PC2 again, it will go through the normal process of flooding until it learns the MAC address on this new interface, and traffic will now follow this path. That's just a quick look at how topology changes are handled in Rapid STP. There is a lot of depth that we could go into about this, but it's not necessary for the CCNA. If you want to go on to get your CCNP and CCIE, you'll definitely have to study these processes more in depth. Before I summarize everything and move on to the quiz, there is one more concept of RSTP you should know, the RSTP link types. RSTP distinguishes between three different link types. The first type is edge. An edge port is a port that is connected to an end host. It moves directly to forwarding without negotiation. Does this sound similar? It sounds like port fast. Well, the port fast functionality was built into RSTP. So there's another STP optional feature built into RSTP by default. Uplink fast, backbone fast, and now port fast. The next link type is point to point. This is used for direct connections between two switches. However, there is one more type, although it is one you probably won't use at all. That type is shared. This is a connection to a hub, like we saw earlier in the video. These connections must operate in half duplex to avoid collisions. Don't confuse these link types with the spanning tree port roles or port states. Basically, the point-to-point -point and shared link types just distinguish between full and half duplex connections. And the edge type is a port that uses port fast. Okay, let's take a quick look at each type. As I said, edge ports are connected to end hosts. Because there is no risk of creating a loop, they can move straight to the forwarding state without the negotiation process. They function like a classic STP port with port fast enabled. In fact, you configure an edge port simply by enabling port fast on the port. Here is the command, just like in classic STP. So really, port fast and an RSTP edge port are the same thing. In this network down here, which ports should be configured as edge ports? Pause the video if you want to think about it. Got the answer? All of these ports, the ones connected to the PCs, should be configured as edge ports. Next up, point to point. These ports connect directly to another switch. Because they connect to a switch, not a hub, they function in full duplex mode. You don't need to configure the interface as point to point. The switch should be able to detect that it is connected directly to another switch and will operate in full duplex as a point to point port. However, if you want to explicitly configure the point to point link type, use this command spanning tree link type point to point. So, which connections in the diagram are point to point? Pause the video to think about it. Did you find the answer? It's these three, 
the direct connections between two switches. Finally, shared ports connect to a hub. Due to the nature of hubs and the likelihood of collisions, these links must function in half duplex. Once again, you don't need to configure the interface in shared mode. The switch will detect it. However, to manually configure it, use this command, spanning tree link type shared. Although you should be aware of this type of RSTP link, as I already said, you will probably never actually see this link type in real networks. Hubs are old technology that have been fully replaced by switches. So which connections in the diagram are shared connections? I think the answer is fairly obvious now. All of the remaining ones, which are connected to the hub. So these connections here are shared links. Before moving on to the quiz, let's summarize what we covered today. First up, we compared the different versions of STP. The classic STP is 802.1D, and Cisco's upgrade is PVST+, which runs a separate spanning tree instance for each VLAN. Then the next standard version is 802.1W, Rapid Spanning Tree Protocol. Cisco's version of this is Rapid PVST+, which again, runs a separate instance for each VLAN. Then there is one more industry standard, multiple spanning tree, with which you can create multiple spanning tree instances and group multiple VLANs within each instance. There is no Cisco version of MSTP. Cisco switches run the industry standard protocol. Then we looked at rapid PVST+, but actually all of the information we looked at applies to the industry standard RSTP as well. RSTP is an evolution of classic STP. Instead of using timers, it uses a negotiation process to allow it to rapidly move the necessary ports to a forwarding state and rapidly adjust to changes in the network topology. I didn't mention any specifics of the negotiation process. That level of depth is not necessary for the CCNA. I told you about the port states in RSTP. There are only three, discarding, learning, and forwarding. The listening state was deemed unnecessary. And in fact, the learning state is often skipped due to the built-in features of rapid STP, like uplink fast and backbone fast. We talked about RSTP port roles. There are four. Root and designated ports are the same, but RSTP distinguishes between two types of ports in the discarding state. Alternate ports are discarding ports, which receive a superior BPDU from another switch. This is the usual case. Backup ports, on the other hand, receive a superior BPDU from an interface on the same switch. This only occurs if connected to a hub, which is a situation you'll probably never encounter. Hubs are no longer used. I also mentioned some optional features of classic STP, which were built into RSTP. First, I showed you uplink fast and backbone fast, but port fast is also built in through the edge port function. Although you have to know port fast for the CCNA, you don't need a detailed understanding of uplink fast and backbone fast. I briefly showed you the RSTP BPDU. Just remember that the protocol version in an RSTP BPDU is two, whereas in classic STP, it's zero. Also, remember the important point that in RSTP, all switches send BPDUs, not just the root bridge. Finally, I showed you the RSTP link types. Edge ports are connected to end hosts, and you configure an edge port by enabling port fast on the interface. Point to point means it is connected directly to another switch, and shared means it is connected to a hub and must use half duplex. As I said before, hubs aren't really used anymore, so you probably won't see a shared link type in any real networks. Okay, let's move on to the quiz. After a few quiz questions, let's take a look at my favorite set of practice exams for the CCNA, Boson Software's XSIM. Back before I started this YouTube channel, I used Boson XSIM to prepare for my CCNA and CCNP exams. And I really think XSIM played a big role in me passing all of my exams on the first try. The questions are very similar to the questions on the real CCNA exam and Boson gives in-depth explanations, 
which really help deepen your understanding of the topics. Okay, now continuing on from quiz question one, which we did earlier in the video, let's go to quiz question two. Which IEEE 802.1D optional features were built into the IEEE 802.1W standard and allow ports to move rapidly to the forwarding state? Select three. A, root guard. B, port fast. C, BPDU guard. D, uplink fast. E, backbone fast. F, loop guard. Or G, root fast. Pause the video to think about your answers. The answers are B, port fast, D, uplink fast, and E, backbone fast. A, root guard, C, BPDU guard, and F, loop guard are spanning tree optional features, but they are not features built into RSTP that allow ports to move rapidly to the forwarding state. G, root fast, is not a real STP optional feature. B, port fast, allows edge ports connected to end hosts to move rapidly to the forwarding state. D, uplink fast, and E, backbone fast, allow ports to move rapidly to forwarding in certain cases of interface failure. Let's go to question three. You want to configure an 802.1W edge port so that hosts connected to the interface can begin sending traffic over the network immediately. Which command should you use? A, spanning tree link type edge. B. Spanning tree mode edge. C. Spanning tree link type port fast. Or D. Spanning tree port fast. Pause the video to think about your answer. The answer is D. Spanning tree port fast. Although edge is a link type in RSTP, you don't use the spanning tree link type command to configure it and the command doesn't even include the word edge. To configure an RSTP edge port, simply configure port fast on the interface with the command spanning tree port fast. Okay, let's do one more quiz question. Identify the root bridge in this network. What is the RSTP port role of each switch? What is the appropriate RSTP link type of each connection between devices? This is a pretty long question. I recommend taking a screenshot and writing the port roles and link types on the screenshot so you can remember everything. Pause the video now to find the answers. Okay, hopefully you solved it. The root bridge is switch one. It has the lowest priority. How about all of the root ports in the network? Here they are. Switch four, picked its G00 interface because switch three has a lower bridge ID than switch two, even though they have the same root cost because the hub doesn't add any cost. So these are the designated ports. Why was an interface on switch two and not switch four selected to be designated? Because switch two has the lower root cost. Finally, the discarding interfaces. Notice that there is one backup interface Switch 2's G02 interface. This is because it receives a superior BPDU from an interface on the same switch, the G01 interface. Now, how about the link types? All of these ports connected to end hosts should be edge ports. All of these full duplex connections between switches are point to point links. And these half duplex connections with the hub are shared links. If you had trouble with this, you should review the spanning tree videos, including this one. And if you still don't understand, feel free to ask a question in the comment section. Okay, now let's check out a question from Boson XSIM for CCNA. Okay, for today's Boson XSIM practice question, I picked a question that mentions edge ports, something you just learned about. So here's the question. Which of the following optional STP features reduces convergence time by immediately placing edge ports into a forwarding state. Select the best answer. So there are five options. A, root guard. B, BPDU guard. C, port fast. D, BPDU filter. And E, loop guard. Pause the video to think about your answer. Okay, did you find your answer? 
So first of all, what is an edge port? Well, it's a port at the edge of the network, meaning it's connected to end host. It's not the internal network between the switches. So which optional feature places ports connected to end hosts immediately into a forwarding state? You should know the answer by now. It is C, port fast. If you're actually doing the practice exam, you can click next to go to the next question, but let's check the answer, show answer. Okay, and we are correct. So you can see it gives quite a detailed explanation. And this is really the great thing about Boson XM, about their practice exams. Not only does it tell you why Portfast is the correct answer, but here it gives you a brief summary of each of these other optional features. Loop guard, uh, root guard, BPDU guard, and BPDU filter. So you can know why they are not the correct answer. After all that, it gives some references to the official cert guide here. This is from chapter nine, uh, optional STP features. And then also some Cisco documentation that you can read online for free. And this is another great study resource, by the way, Cisco's official documentation. Okay, if you wanna get a copy of Boson XM for yourself, please follow the link in the video description. I used Boson XM myself for my CCNA and CCNP. And I really think they were essential in helping me pass all of my exams on the first try. So once again, please click that link in the video description and get a copy of Boson XM. There are supplementary materials for this video. There is a flashcard deck to use with the software Anki. Download it from the link in the description and use the flashcards to review the concepts you learned in this video. There will also be a packet tracer practice lab so you can get some hands-on practice. That will be in the next video. Before finishing today's video, I want to thank my JCNP level channel members. Thank you to TB, Vikram, Joyce, Marek, Samil, Velva Jacum, C Mode, Johan, Mark, Miguel, Yusuf, Kony, Boson Software, the creators of XM, CD, Magrathia, Devin, Charlesetta, Lito, Jonathan, Mike, Alexander, Vance, and Gerard. Sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly, but thank you so much for your support. One of you is still displaying as channel failed to load. If this is you, please let me know and I'll see if YouTube can fix it. This is the list of JCNP level members at the time of recording, by the way, May 27th, 2020. If you signed up recently and your name isn't on here, don't worry, you'll be in future videos. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment, and share the video with anyone else studying for the CCNA. If you want to leave a tip, check the links in the description. I'm also a Brave verified publisher and accept BAT or basic attention token tips via the Brave browser. That's all for now.